Emperor of Yggdrasil, Overlord Fanfiction. Chapter 42 Coming of Inferno. The former Roble Holy Empire became a beacon of distress and chaos. The believers of each religion in the Yggdrasil League's continent stay away from this beacon, as the preachers spread information from their gods that the former holy place became a corrupted place where the Jaldabaoth reborn and control their god's enemy, which is Ains. This well-constructed propaganda is effective in scaring the masses and even if these believers didn't hear these prophecies, all but one command from their god they will follow to the letter. And in a room somewhere in Vassal Roble where luxury is everywhere, a large multicolored chandelier that emitted light hung from the ceiling and furniture suitable for kings and nobles was placed around. The marble floor was polished and sparkled. The Jaldabaoth and his puppet, which his Ains are seating on a black, comfortable couch, reading these prophecies of theirs. I think if the Krixelic knows of this, they will purge all people in this continent. Ains then looked up and saw Demiurge's face twisted with anger in his eyes. This must be stopped, Ainsama. Your precious name is being sullied by these low, dash, Demiurge shouted with disbelief. He is about to start another holocaust, but on a much larger scale, but Ain stopped him and waves his hand that calmed Demiurge's rage. Let them be. The more they underestimate us, the more options we can choose. Also, other continents will hear of this, lowering their guard or becoming aggressive, which is an advantage also to us, after he spoke. A knock came on the double door and Ains instruct them to enter. He saw the five divine world enemy servants of his. The archangels of Sapphira walk up to him with elegance and kneel. Master, we are here to serve. He examined them, and they look the angels the mortals expected to be, beautiful and graceful, some of them actually. But Ains knows their true forms, and even demons will be scared. It still weirded him because he commands almost all known world enemies, and is also kneeling. But still, problems arise that overwhelm even my overpopulated guardians, Ains thought. Master can destroy this world in one order, but Ain Sama did not want that. That is why it is difficult to solve problems in other means other than resulting in complete destruction. Keter is an eight foot tall angel with no facial features, just a smooth, spotless surface, and four protruding bulky horns that may resemble demons, but it is covered in white flames. His upper body barely misses some fragments here and there with a crater in the middle of his chest. His lower body, on the other hand, is only consisting of ash-gray vine-looking bones, almost devoid of skin and flesh. Though the physique of his looks like a very damaged angel, but this body can resist multiple super-tier spells without a scratch thus he may be created with this physique to deceive or something else. Beside Keter is his right hand, Chakma. He is an extremely attractive angel with brown hair and gray eyes that lack pupils that can rival Michael and Lucifer in appearance. With one set of white feathered wings and dressed in a white and blue armor with exquisite detailing, he is seven feet tall but not significantly taller than Ains. Bina is considered the master of bows, as he can pierce an arrow even from a far distance. His golden two paired eyes seem to glow and his golden hair flows freely in the air like a gushing wind pushing his hair up. He is clad in an ornate golden armor with a brown trench coat and is holding a bow, a divine class item named the Usurper. The ancient angel Chesed is a candidate for the goddess of beauty. She has a divine face that may captivate both men and women thanks to her domineering keen eyes and radiantly flawless skin. Like Albedo, she has wings close to her lower back and is adorned with golden embroideries. Gavira's appearance makes him easily mistaken for an undead, yet he is not one since he radiates a holy aura that has the power to destroy an undead of low level. His lower body is just a mystery of its own as he has no pelvis and spine that connects the upper body and lower body which is not weird at all. A long scarf is wrapped up around his neck and covered his two arms. He also has a red sword pierced in his chest which Ains does not know what is the purpose of that after a few seconds, he responds with three remote of viewing, appearing beside them. So they are moving and responding as we expected. So now I want you to accompany Albedo here and move south towards the theocracy to commence talks. Albedo then steps forward and bow as she is quiet the entire time, and even Demiurge forgets that she is there, the other Albedo. It will be done, master. Their response is still monotone as their face are always emotionless. I said this many times Ains will do, 
You are all my servants, and you should address me as such as you all earned it. Is that understood? Ains sighed. He wants his servants to talk comfortably without restraint on him, as he considered them as his own children. We understand Ain Sama, and I hope you measure their strength as we have little to no information on them. I have important business to attend to and I must go now, before he stands up and left to go somewhere. He remembered something. Oh, our gifts to them, Demiurge snaps his fingers and five archdemons appear carrying two body bags. Tell them I send my regards. Ains said his final words as he stand up and leave the room. Demiurge follows behind him with a smirk on his face. Yes, Ain Sama, when their master and Demiurge depart, the five angels stand up and look at the lady called Albedo in front of them. You are not Albedo Sama, correct? I am Albedo, but not the Albedo you know of. Albedo responded in a toneless manner, I thought so. Albedo Sama has a different aura than your own weaker and seem frail dash Chisid was about to narrate all things that this albedo has not but was interrupted by Keter. That is enough Chisid. Keter looked at the angel and she nods stopping at her words. They don't know if they hurt the emotional feelings of a sentient being but Keter does study a little and he observes that Chisid's words may hurt this albedo but he doesn't deny the statement that is being said. Now let's go. Time is of the essence. Chakma implies and Keter first goes out with Albedo, not saying anything anymore as she followed the rest of the ancient angels as they drag the loud body bags who are screaming nonsense, but they pay it no heed. Somewhere in the former Arglan state. The known remaining dragonlords of the new world are now soaring in the skies as they reminisce the golden age of this kingdom where demi-humans prosper and the true dragons rule with high heads. Now the cities are nowhere to be found as the land is dark because of the war that Evra started as he raised the ground into ashes. All demi-human citizens and dragons are wiped out in the Argland as the dryads and treants are walking in the ashes with a death aura on them. They eternally submit to the fallen. The cities became a second Katza Plains where it produced undead and the Nazarick Empire benefits from it. Then they saw two ashy mountains with several broken-down castles and curtain walls around them. But these two mountains are once one whole mountain but something, or someone split it in half, and this is the former capital before someone destroyed it, a being that should never exist, do such a thing. When they land on the ground near the central plaza, the ashes in the ground moved away and dry blood is lingering on the paved ground. The buildings are broken down and the golden dragon statues standing in the middle of the plaza are nowhere to be found definitely stolen by mercenaries or other nations as trophies. Their faces seem to show anger and disgust. They are only alive because while the destruction of Argland is happening, they are on a diplomatic mission to solve the growing tension between the players and them, the Dragonlords. They have either a lot of luck, or the gods want them to suffer longer. The Dragonlords transform into their human forms and St. Dorcas cast a spell. The ground trembles as the central plaza opens up, and pieces of the paved road seem to drop below where they cannot see the end of this trench. They one by one enter the trench and St. Dorcas is the last who jumps as the large hole in the central plaza disappears leaving no traces and the ashes return covering the dry bloody paved ground. When an almost endless drop is reached they softly land and are welcomed by a long dark hallway filled with dragon bones and pieces of strange metal in the ground. They are the former royal guards that guard the former dragon emperor's life, and when they cannot do their duty, they execute themselves in the dragon emperor's tomb. The walls are carved with glowing many glowing hieroglyphs. Every wall depicts a story, the story of the long reign of the dragon lords, and every ancestry and house is recorded as battles they fought. Now it is like they are just stories told by the children as this long golden history end in one night. TSA touches the wall reminiscing the past and his lover, or mate also died that night. Everything he has disappeared in one night because of his father, specifically his father's greed for more power. Dragons do show some greed whether in wealth, power, or in many things. His father crosses the threshold and the gods punish him for that. Maybe they deserve it as the gods deem it so. After his mind wanders, the dragon lords he is with stop in their tracks and just stare forward. He focused on where they are staring and mixed emotions went inside him. The corpse of the dragon emperor is missing. 
The preserved corpse of the dragon emperor in the middle of this tomb is missing and the only thing that remains here is the large statues of dragon knights that are made of stone and well carved that they may seem to move at any moment. H. How. A dark aura surrounded the tomb as the entrance they went and disappeared. A black ooze suddenly appears on the edges of the walls and starts to cover the walls and ceiling. They all became aware of what is going on. They readied themselves as the Dragonlords prepare their wild magic in case someone attacked. TSA try to cast a spell world teleportation, but nothing happened. Two Dragonlords, the Brightness Dragon Lord Postemius and Deep Darkness Dragon Lord Omis dash to the area where the passageway is and Dark Dragonlord delivers a powerful punch into the wall and nothing happens. Even a dent is not seen. You are getting weak young one. Brightness Dragon Lord laughs and delivers a booming punch in the same spot where the Darkness Dragon Lord punched, and the same result happens. As if the Black Ooze Wall absorbs the impact, which it does. Then, one by one, the stone large statues start to move as they unsheathe their swords with red burning eyes. Zar transforms immediately into his dragon form. With a blink of an eye, the silver scaled dragon charges to the nearest stone statue and points its sword toward him with fury on the statue's red burning eyes. Another stone statue behind the Tsar starts to run at an unprecedented speed. It jumps and spun in the air like it has wings its sword was about to swing in his direction but another dragon, with glass-like scales that reflects light, rammed the stone statue in midair. Omis, the darkness dragonlord, is fighting three statues in his dark dragon form. Tsar meters away from the stone statue. He jumped and took flight as the stone statue jumped as well and swing his sword towards him. The dragon lord's tail forcefully swings toward the sword to deflect it bo um, mm, 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 mm. It created a shockwave as Zar saw dents on the statue's sword. He landed as he feel pain in his tail. He never noticed it until now but the stone statues emit something strange. Something that is definitely unknown to them and he try to cast wild spells but he can't as something is also interfering. He glanced at where the obsidian dragonlord Mizuno is, she is settled in the middle of the tomb, sitting while watching them as she is protected by swordmaster dragonlord, Karahashi. Zar ordered Karahashi to protect the last living female dragonlord, to preserve their line or ancestry. When he looks back at where the statue is, it disappears, then pain flows down his back. He looked back and saw a sword pierce in his back. He heard also groaning and roaring as the other two dragonlords are pierced with stone swords, and their opponents, the giant stone statues, disappeared also. He scans the whole tomb and is shocked as they are back in their places with new stone swords in their belt, though they are not moving. The whole tomb is now covered in black ooze, and now it forms black spikes closing in the middle, where Mizuno is. The ooze black spikes are getting closer and closer as the dragonlords breathe fire towards these strange looking spikes. They are everywhere and the dragonlords go back to their human form as their place is getting cramped. They are cornered in the middle where all dark spikes creeping towards them and they bumped into each other as they face inches away from the death that will befall them. Their teeth grit as the spikes are about to touch their body but then they heard a loud crack. I hope your little adventure is fruitful. They heard a deep and regal voice, a familiar one. The spikes that are about to end the species of new world dragons melt into the ground as the black ooze in the ceiling turns into a dark liquid that creates a small rain in the tomb. The walls that are covered with black ooze also started to evaporate, thus creating dark smoke. The path they use earlier opens with green vines with various flowers crawling at the edges of the entrance, which starts to cover the whole place. From that entrance, Come out the player that saved them before. One of the so-called players, but different. He is clad in jet black full body armor, adorned with various mystical beast scales on his breastplate that shines. Around his both shoulders are six black, thick spikes curved upwards. He also has a long dark cape in the back and a coattail from the hips of his armor at ankle length. In his belt was a sword that the devil gods created. It emits an extreme amount of demon aura that can corrupt a low-tier angel with its aura alone. A weapon should never be possessed by a person, especially a player behind the said player are his servants or called NPCs that are very loyal to him. The ancient dragons who are behind the player are definitely equal to the dragon emperor in terms of power or worst, more powerful. Come out or I will make you come out. The emperor points his demonic sword in the empty corner where darkness only lingers. 
After a few seconds the darkness twitches and from that darkness forms a being, like a human but covered in darkness. Wings made of blackness sprout from its back as the empty face began to form a skin and when it did. F father? Zar muttered, but all of them heard. The dragon emperor is alive and in front of them. The eyes are similar but there is a hollow feeling to it. Like there is no soul in the eyes of the dragon emperor. That weak being is already dead. I am now reborn to serve the true god, Typhon the servant. The former dragon emperor said with joy, and he glare at Emperor Ain's old gown that interrupted his task given by his master. You are an obstacle in his path that should be terminated. Typhon's words are sharp as his aura darkens. Oh, your master is only a dust in my way is what I see Emperor of Ain's said with a laugh. The dark being disappear as the emperor also vanish and sparks around the tomb started to appear with a haze appearing here and there. The clanging of a thousand swords rang everywhere and the dragonlords don't know what is happening but the ancient dragon saw everything. Their master is parrying all attacks that this dragon emperor gave. Dark swords flying everywhere at an astronomical speed. But their master, as expected parries all of them without a sweat. They thought he is dancing because every move is precise. Thousands of dark swords throw at him, but none even touch his armor. The dragon emperor is just in the distance watching and looks worried. He should be. All of them thought Ains then point at Typhon, and a magic circle materializes in front of his pointing finger. Rain of scorn! He whispered and thousands of small dark cubes appear in the ceiling, and it shoot towards Typhon. Several dark barriers form around the dragon emperor as he gritted his teeth, and the impact of the thousands of dark cubes causes large cracks in the first barrier. Typhon can't see anything because he is surrounded by thousands of cubes and can't hear anything for some reason. Asterisk clang. A demonic sword makes a way in the sea of dark cubes and collide with his barrier, shattering all of them at once as Typhon crosses his arms to block the attack. Ah! Eh? A scream that can pierce many mortal ears, the block did not work and shattered his arms. The demonic sword did not end there as it passed through Typhon's head all the way through his lower body, cutting him in two. Ains rammed towards Typhon, in result, exploding in the spot where the dragon's body shattered in smaller pieces. One life, one to go smile crept internally as Nova informed him that killing Typhon earned few EXP which is still EXP for him. To go beyond my limits is an exciting thought, he whispered but Kulshidra go beside her and press herself in his arm. Ains felt the sensations of two large mounts, but pay them no heed. Is something troubling Ains Sama? I will take it away if you wish, Kulshidra whispered in his ear which sent shivers of unknown emotions. Her eyes feel like a predator that caught his prey, and his mind tells him to go away at once. Hmm, what is going on with you Kulshidra? Ains asks directly, but still not escaping the grasp of this ancient dragon. Kulshidra shyly looks down and whispered, I am just in awe of your power, Ainsama. He saw her cheeks blushed as Tiamat just stare at her with disappointment eyes. Yes, Tiamat is aroused in the show of power, but they as servants should show restraint. So the saying is true, the strong attracts beauty? Or along those lines, Ains thought, Dragons are greedy for treasures, but many dragons differentiate the meaning of treasure. Some are gold, precious items, all kinds of power, and many more. Before Ains can say something a ball of light appear in the ground where Typhon exploded, and it form a being similar to Typhon's physique, but now he has horns and a dragon tail. You will lose now, Typhon said with his hoarse voice. You are Typhon, but not the original depiction. I fight your original self, and it is really fun. But fighting you is not an amusing way to use my time. Now let's end this Ains place his demonic sword in front of him, and the sword raged convulsing black fire toward Typhon. He responds by lashing his dragon tail into the ground creating a large crater. His horns light up as the glass of reality seems to melt around it. Typhon's body start to be surrounded by black fire as he laughs. After all the undead's weakness is fire. If it does not work then he can result to holy artifacts that his master gave to him the undead before him, just hums as the ancient dragoness beside him walks back, but glares at him with the intent to kill his whole existence. The undead is about to step forward, and he disappears. No sound is heard as Typhon widens his eyes, and his whole body shivers in fear. 
He instantly looks back and saw the death himself, and the demonic raging sword inches away from his neck before he can react his body turns into pieces and exploded in light motes. The tomb shook a bit as the walls were covered in countless slashes that seemed to appear all of a sudden. Some had burn marks on them. Kulshidra and Tiamat began to applaud at the show of power Ains shows, but the Dragonlords just watch as they don't know what happens. Ain sama someone interfere in extracting Typhon's soul. His personal assistant, Nova, spoke in his mind. He scanned the tomb but saw nothing other than his guardians Tiamat and Kulshidra and the Dragonlords. He nods to Kulshidra and Tiamat and they immediately disappear. Kulshidra seep her aura everywhere to detect if there are spies that they don't know as Tiamat began to cast a pool of water that create a vein-like structure searching for the said being. Not yet, master. In two days, I will ascertain this individual. Nova, replied Ain Sama. The surroundings are clear Kulshidra message there is one being sitting in the plaza. A very powerful being but can be killed easily Tiamat message and waiting for his orders. So that is him? Yes, master. But do not worry. I am generating defensive responses including if you are eliminated Ain Sama, but that will not happen. For a second he thought. Nova became furious and cold but narrated all of these defensive plans with her usual monotone tone, definitely his imagination. While he is listening to the long list of defensive plans of Inova, that may seem overreacting to others, but in his point of view, it is enough. His two guardians teleported back as his orders, Kulshidra and Tiamat start to scold all the dragonlords as they are kneeling down with their heads bowed. If I am your dragon mother, I will lash the soul out of all of you. Kulshidra gave a terrifying lecture to the dragonlords. They also shiver at every word Kulshidra utter. Umu, your planning is reckless and I might say stupid. You should learn from this and be cautious when necessary Ains help them as Kulshidra nodded in agreement with Tiamat just beside Ains. Then someone enters the room, a certain archdemon, every step, and move shows complete elegance and a smile bore on the demon's face. The demon bowed at Ains and the soothing voice rang, Ain Sama. The enemy forces on the far east are being transported in the slain theocracy. What do we do supreme one-inch demiurge cunningly said that Ains thinks demiurge already, I will deal with something first you Kulshidra and Tiamat will wait here. Demiurge send forces to the enemy bases beyond our borders, but does not totally eliminate them. The rest is up to you, Demiurge. Ains then starts to buff himself with all tier spells he knows which is abundant to prepare for the confrontation. While doing this, he looks at his bony hand and thought, Many will die on my enemy's side, but this is for the good of our home. It is totally strange to not feel anything when ordering a massacre, but an advantage also when it is a necessity. He sighed internally and saw Demiurge's face that has blissful face. Kulshidra and Tiamat looks worried but just nod. I understand Ainsama. I will not disappoint you in the results. Demiurge bowed as Ains waved his hand and teleported to the surface to face this being waiting for him. Face, you see, near the south border of Roble Holy Kingdom. Several castles are being built by the low-tier angels that work tirelessly as the divine casters from the slain theocracy that summon them are commanding these low-tier angels. Mid-tier angels of different kinds are patrolling the growing fortress city as two flags are fluttering at the main gate. The flag of slain theocracy and the sigil of the magic conquerors are waving proudly side by side. High walls made of strange metal that became very tough based on how strong the impact of the projectile is. The wall around the base is impossible to climb because it became a liquid-like substance when someone touches it or puts something in it where it will just slide down. Green armored soldiers and white armored knights are patrolling around the perimeter with their advanced magic rifles that have sensors that can detect even the high wraiths. Rows of the green armored soldiers of the Magic Conqueror's Alliance are lining up in front of the main gate ready to march towards the conquered Roble. They are just waiting for the armored infantry the tanks and long-ranged artilleries with the air support, but they are late. These two allied legions are the first nations that will first attack the conquered former Holy Roble and capture a city inside for an advantage foothold. In the north, the Nazarick Empire and the nations of the three goddesses will attack the northern part as they aggressively push towards the capital because of Nazarick's players' rage towards this enemy. A Tentian one of the green, armored soldiers, decorated with gold medals on his left upper chest, shouted as the soldiers of the magic conquerors stand rigidly. 
As you know, my name is Isaac, one of the seven great magic conquerors. Now here we stand in our allies' lands, and now our ally and our nations in the east are being threatened by an enemy we're thinking is barbaric and cruel that needs to be taught by our high civilization. We will not stand by and just watch the barbaric actions of this enemy of ours and give justice to those deaths that die in vain. Asterisk boom. The ground shakes violently and some soldiers threw in the air and land hard on the ground. The skies became dark as night like the sun hides from the chaos that is about to brew as large booming sounds rang in every direction. The bells of the fortress rang furiously as the soldiers panicked but form a proper perimeter in front of the main gates. Isaac activated his battle suit and the new technology. The nanotech covered his body instantly and two light blades that can cut through almost everything formed like a claw in his hands. They are here, and we will show them who. Isaac stopped because dark thick fog come out of the forest and instantly surrounded the whole forest meters away from them. As they saw massive shadows that is a size of 500 meters high and the shadows are wide. Isaac heard the divine magic casters in the back that they can't teleport and something is interfering with their magic, a confirmation that this is not a natural phenomenon. Then someone walk out of the fog right in the front main gate. Meters away from them, an unknown demon that looks like a demi-human as he had a head of a wolf but has four burning eyes. But its scales look like molten rocks and its four eyes that stare into their soul send shivers of unknown fear. It smiles as if it sensed their fear and bore hunger in its expression. State yourself. In Isaac's suit, the light blades disappear into 60 calories. Rifle form in front of him and pointed at this creature. I have no name but you can call me Demon Guardian Weak One. The Demon Guardian spoke with a low and booming voice as he plunged his great sword into the ground and leaned on it. Then Demon Guardian, what is your purpose in invading this land? Isaac stepped forward with his magic rifle ready to trigger with his troops, already aiming for the Demon Guardian. In his ear there is a communication device and his other troops inside are preparing for a weapon that can kill mid-tier summons which is enough the Demon Guardian laugh. I will go with this facade of yours while you ready your slow weapon. Isaac didn't flinch or show fear, but his heart beats faster than it normally is. We are ordered by the Supreme One to eliminate you all because of this act of aggression that you create. If you kill me, all nations and my fellow magic conquerors will kill your master. Even the way to do that is to destroy this world. So you have threatened the Supreme One. Bad choices of words indeed. The demon guardian pulls his sword into the ground. He sidesteps and a powerful red beam struck his former position, now striking a tree nearby. The demon guardian howl and slowly point his sword towards their base. Then they heard countless chilling roars and look up to see hundreds of dragons flying down from above. The defensive artillery start to shoot the dragons in the skies and they killed a few dragons, but still several dragons land on the top of the castles and spew dragon fire that melts literally everything. They started to burn the artilleries as some dragons that has more aggressive instincts landed in the gathered humans and used their tails and large claws to slash everything they saw alive. Some straight up devour the soldiers, and some bite furiously and throw them into the sky. Asterisk ah. Isaac heard inside the fortress screech of his soldiers, and was about to order his men to go inside and rescue the soldiers inside, but something came out of the fog. The abomination that should not exist. Three gigantic beings come out from the fog, and the divine magic casters shouted that these beings are demons. Isaac thought them demons because of their horns and dark armor that are similar design to the demons the green soldiers without their higher officers' commands fire their magic rifles out of fear as one of the gigantic demons slams his scythe into the ground and a crater forms around it with large rifts that have lava below crawling towards the main army. Oi get out of the y -ch 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 -ch. Soldiers that can't run away from the crawling, scorching rifts fall from it. All of them heard the terrifying scream of pain who fall from the rifts, but some officers who has jetpacks activated it and escaped from the rift while this chaos ensue. Another rise as the two colossal demons started running and their scythe swung left and right in the ground like they are gardening but blood splashing everywhere and bones. Then the worst happens as different kinds of demons come out from the fog. They surrounded the whole base as demons seems to come out countlessly. These demons charged in all directions as the soldiers and divine archers defending the wall have now two problems. The dragons inside wreaking havoc and demons outside hungering for blood. 
The air was thick with the stench of blood and death as the two forces collided. The sound of the shooting of bullets from magic rifles and roaring demons echoed across the battlefield, drowning out the cries of the wounded and dying. Isaac is in the middle of it. The surroundings froze, and the screams and the loud bullets deafen. In front meters away from him is this demon guardian, holding his great sword in front of his face and looking at him. With a grin bore in the demon guardian's face, he fully charged forward, his sword gleaming from the light that come out of the rifts as he swing it towards the magic conqueror without restraint. Isaac was quick on his feet, dodging out of the way and firing a blast of magical energy at his opponent's belly. The demon guardian deftly parried the attack, his great sword deflecting the energy back toward the magic conqueror. He stumbled back, but quickly regained his footing and fired another shot at the demon guardian. The two continued to exchange blows, each one determined to gain the upper hand. The demon guardian swung his sword with exact precision and Isaac darted around the battlefield, firing blasts of energy from his rifle while also dodging the gigantic demon's attacks. But as the fight wore on, it became clear that the demon guardian was gaining the advantage. He had honed his skills with the great sword for thousands of years in hell, and he knew every trick and technique in the book. The magic conqueror, on the other hand, was struggling to keep up. He had never faced an opponent like this before. This demon guardian is definitely one of the direct servants of their enemy, and he was finding it difficult to land a decisive blow. But just when it seemed like all was lost, the magic conqueror had an idea. He quickly loaded a special type of magical ammunition into his rifle, one that was infused with magical energy against demons. As the demon guardian charged towards him once again, Isaac took aim and fired. The blast of energy hit the demon guardian squarely in the chest, knocking him back several feet. The demon guardian tries to stand up again but the large hole in his chest weakens him every second until he turns into motes of light while Isaac just stared at it. He is tired as he uses all of his energy and mana on that last attack. He contacts some of his high generals and starts to run towards the direction where the slain theocracy was as they cut down the demons which are weak for them but are too many for his soldiers. You may have won this battle, but the war is not over, he spat at their enemy as he watched from afar the base of their alliance being devoured by dragons and demons. At least he cut down one of the direct servants of their enemy he thought. As is e one hour before the attack on the south fortress. In the north where the forestry is rich, the northern forces use the trees as camouflage and the base is more like a camp with a million of undead just standing straight in files. Some undead, death knights, and death warriors patrolled with angels and demons accompanying them. These two forces are the summons of Nazarick and the three goddesses of the north that will strike the northern cities of Roble as the players that will lead them goes at moment in the Riestei's capital to commence a meeting to strategize their next operation. Nia is the one that is positioned to be the head general. She is in a room that was large, with a long table stretching down the center and chairs lined up on either side. At the far end sat a group of stern-looking men and women in different clothing, their faces etched with lines of experience and authority. They are all discussing the matters of how to assault the nearest city and gain a foothold inside their enemy's territory is of the utmost importance. Her vice general Gazef Stranoff is beside her, just listening to the reports and just nodding when he agreed to a statement. The meeting lasted for almost one hour, with no clear resolution or decision reached on the tactic that they will apply. Nia and Gazef are the last to leave the room. The two of them felt drained and exhausted, but these times are war so this sacrifice is needed. The enemy's defenses, according to our intel, is so undefended and weak, which is doubtful. This may be a trap, General Nia. They are strolling outside on who knows where with death warriors behind them as their guards. You know Nia will be fine, Gazef. It is weird also to be addressed formally by a true general. Now in your view, this may be so. But the Supreme One's ordered to do this to rescue Albedo Sama. She look at one of the human patrol squads as they bow to them and go back to their patrolling. I have many doubts that Albedo Sama will be in Roble, Gazef spoke, but the servants of the enemy inside Roble know. I hope, Nia uttered quietly as she knows many will die, but the Supreme Ones will guide them, and she is also willing to die for them. Then the silence followed, though they didn't know the death warriors behind them are nowhere to be found. Chapter 43 Coming of Inferno, Part 2 The Sorcerer Celestial Empire became a beacon of terror 
the chaos that will devour anything in its way. But for the weak, it became of hope, where the lower food chain does not need to mind what they will eat the next morning. Every being in the protection of the sorcerer empire has comfort and joyful life, thus many want to protect it so many join the military. Even becoming a city guard is an honor and highly respected by the imperial citizens. Now cities rise around the continent where the sorcerer empire rules. Four cities in the north, south, east, and west of Supreme Imperial City. These megacities became the second main transportation for grabbing thousands of opportunities and need that they want to achieve. The Supreme Imperial City has now six walls that became the largest city in the known world and still expanding based on its needs. These megacities surrounding the Supreme Imperial City are named by Ains as Albedo, Acadia, Darkness, and Angela with Aishira still in construction in the south next to Acadia. In the North Albedo City stands, this city is where the most administrative facilities are located with labs, factories, and camps that are a top secret being produced or innovated like the Clone Army Program and Automaton Legion where these two fighting forces will join the main army of the Empire. When completed these two fighting forces will compensate for the more quality than quantity of Supreme Soldiers. Citronita's new labs were also built here to sell the Empire's mass production potions that are approved to sell inside and outside of the borders of the Empire. Even the controlled criminal underworld sells these potions, but the ones who can affect the Empire will not be allowed to sell or even reveal the potions' information in public. In the south is Acadia City where the merchant establishment lingers with business and manufacturing are the main focus of this city. Banks that are controlled by the Celestial International Bank and Imperial Reserves are kept in this city. Fashion also of all sorts is a growing factor in this city with many species sharing their traditions and festivities also celebrated here. Angela City is in the west where the judiciary rules and has bases everywhere where dungeons and torture rooms are operated however, they are all hidden. The people only see on the outside are the abundant temples spread across this city with gardens and parks that many are fascinated especially the children whose wonders are open. At night, Women and children are not scared anymore to be kidnapped, harassed by drunken fools, or murdered as on every street there are patrols and city guards keeping the safety of the citizens of the empire on top priority. And in the east is Darkness City, where establishments for different kinds of entertainment are offered, thus it became a main attraction for adults who wants to have some time for themselves. The best taverns in the empire with various unique wines and drinks are produced here and exported to different parts of the empire. Also, the ones who want to have top-quality armor and weapons are sold here with the Mercenary Guild transferred to this city from the Supreme Imperial City. One of the new bases for the Sorcerer Secret Agency is stationed here in the Darkness City where informants and sorcerer agents are everywhere to monitor possible rebellion and shut it down. Beneath the Darkness City, there is a base with a sleek black interior without much aesthetic design as functionality is a priority over pleasing the eyes. In every corner of this underground base, celestial marines, as they also guard every room and make sure that no one can enter the government property hidden or in brute force. Many humanoids, demi-humans, and heteromorphs are clad in dark uniforms of the SSC, Sorcerer Secret Agency, with dark masks that cover their faces. No one can infiltrate without causing chaos as the passcode and their identification codes change in intervals of 10 minutes or are sometimes at random times for security purposes. Also the Central Command, the ACC, Atlas Command Center, is now divided with the SSA Central Command recording every communication for possible investigation of an operation when needed. Albedo, Darkness, Acadia, and Angela are walking in the base for inspections as Aishira cannot attend because of the pile-up business that she needs to attend to at the cathedral as they will start a new crusade on the enemy's continent and cleanse the sins that flood its people. Behind them are ten seraph Empyrean and succubi slash succubus from the royal guards of Ains. Ains gives them his small portion of guards with several more employed in the immortal army for their protection and command them however they please. Ain Sama is always busy with the things that the guardians should work for, Angela said with a pout on her cheek. After all, she doesn't get the attention she wants from her love. Our husband is a benevolent ruler and wise emperor, so this is expected, but to be this busy. Darkness looks concerned as the guardians will have no more value when Ain Sama does all the work. May I remind you that almost all guardians including us are all occupied, 
and actually surprised that all of this work is overwhelming our workforce. Acadia said, in her hands is a folder that consists of the information in this base and checks all lacking features or materials that it needs. The outsiders that Ain Sama recruited from the vassal countries are productive and actually smart that can keep up with the work that is being issued, especially the newcomer from the merchant commerce. Albedo commented as she surveyed the base of the SSC and Celestial Marines and point out weaknesses in the security defenses on Acadia. Then they saw Hela and Darkseid walking side by side as they are accompanied by SSC agents clad in their black armor, dark red cape, and dark full mask. They bowed and Hela first spoke, Greetings honorary overseers, this is our very first encounter. We saw you all from observation, but yes, this is our very first physical encounter. Acadia said with her smile beaming, What are you doing here? A task from the Supreme Emperor perhaps? Angela spoke, Yes Angela Sama. We are gathering information about these magic conquerors ordered by the Supreme One. Hela replied with dark side nodded in agreement Albedo is about to speak, but then someone messaged her. Let's go. Some emissary from the Immortal Wars are here to discuss relations and possible alliance. They are on the south heading to Yoveria escorted by our airships, then a gate opened and the overseers enter with their guards following them. When the swirling dark portal closed Hela and Darkseid with their retinue, walk towards the exit of this hall. Teleportation is forbidden, except for the overseers and the supreme one himself. While they are walking in the dark hallways, Hela spoke breaking the silence, this new guy. Nyalathotep is also going with us. So be nice to him after all, he is one of the relatives of Shub Nigarath Dano, Hela said as Darkseid said nothing, his assistant on the other hand, has a worried expression on his face. A relative of Shub is definitely another outer god which is a bad omen, but if this being is another loyal servant of the Supreme One then gods be damned. Another stronger being on the Supreme One's side. Our enemies will be trampled one way or the other. Desad says and nods with his Lord Darkseid also nodding. They have a problem as the three mother boxes they own were lost in the war on earth. Now one of Darkseid's servants Steppenwolf contacted them and said that he found these mother boxes. Their supreme being has not answered this request of theirs to retrieve it and can take his time if he wants as the time here is different from the other world. Their supreme lord will surely be pleased as these powerful artifacts can terraform the earth into a planet similar to Apocalypse and can control the sentient beings there if the ritual completes. After all Mistress Death is planning to obtain their universe's powerful artifacts that have the same power as world-class items when combined. The ones who will go with her when this plan began are Chaos King, Surtur, and the woman beside him, Hela. They will commence this plan when the war is over and have the full permission of Ain's old gown. A slight competition as he can do this on his own, but he knows that few other guardians will be assigned to this extraction a the siege the encampment that the Nazarek Empire and the three goddesses created. Where the angels and undead coexist is now in chaos. The forest around them that they use as camouflage is howling with the grass beneath their encampment and the trees that cover them withered or turned to ashes. The clanging of swords and the sounds of the raging undead roared around, attacking their current allies the angels. The angels bring light in the darkness as they pour their forces, some look like are berserk killing every undead in their way. The human knights on the two sides start to join in because they thought that the alliance broke and they became enemies for an obviously chaotic reason. Even though they don't know how it started, the two human knight forces are now enemies and should fight for their gods. The faith and courage of the angels are what keep them going even as the odds grew increasingly dire as one undead falls, two take their place. In the sky, cannons start to ring in the air as the undead ships sail below and start to rampage the Empyrean ships that are about to support the angels below one. What the hell happened? One angel with six wings spoke. He just got here when he heard the clanging noises from the base and thought it is attacked. Now he saw the angels from his three goddesses and the undead from the Nazarek players fighting each other. The talks between the three goddesses and the Nazarek players seem to not work, but to this extent is madness. I can't use messages to contact our goddesses, but we must retreat something might dash, then they sense someone glaring at them. He followed where it is and looked down to see a demon covered in blue flame. The Supreme One will come for all, and no one can stop him, the blue demon pointed at him, and seems to mutter, but they heard it all the same, even the long distance. 
That demon might be the reason. My connections on my summons are cut. The angel said as she has a sad expression on her face because she consider all of her summons as her children. That is preposterous. One of the darker hair angels shouted with disbelief, but not impossible. Gather the ones who are not affected by this attack and retreat dash. All of the angels in the base stopped in their assault as they all felt pain in their wings. The high-tier angels look behind them and their wings are slowly turning gray as the low-tier angels' plated armor falls apart. Their metal skin slowly turned into red chunk meat with their helm also falling apart, replacing a crazed demon face. Their holy aura also diminishes replaced by a dark demon aura as they now wreak havoc with themselves or the undead like they go berserk. We need to leave now. The thought of reporting this is of the utmost importance. There is something happening and the three goddesses should know of this. They fly off from here without looking back. F.E.S.E. Before the hour of this disaster, the meetings are already not going well. Two factions actually build up inside the Ain's old gown. Touch Me's and Ulbert's side. After all, they found out that somehow the family of Touch Me was transported into this world. Touch Me confessed, but he did not reveal how it's possible. That is why the already growing tension between Touch Me and Ulbert rose further, and only Momonga is the one lowering the tensions, but he even sees that this will be difficult. We need to gather more information as this intel is not enough, Touch Me said as the three goddesses nodded in agreement. What do you want? For the sun to become frozen, the ocean to become desert, I should be out there, lighting up that goddamn continent. Ulbert raged again as his eyes widened. Mamanga sighed as the spiteful bickering start again. Ulbert's voice rises at every sentence he delivers. And you should know why we, Punito Mo, did not allow that Ulbert San. Mamanga reminded them. They after all have not enough intel in this empire, even one weakness which is frustrating even for him. Because while we cower the enemy takes advantage of us. Ulbert shouted not to Momonga, but for the whole room to hear. They will take advantage of us more when we attack with no information. A stupid action. Touch me said equal to Ulbert's voice. That is why your fam dash Ulbert stopped as even he knows he goes too far. And before touch me attacked Ulbert. Momonga hold touch me's shoulder as he felt the world champion's aura start to emit from him. Touch me stand up and leave without saying a word as Punito looked at Ulbert with the intention of consuming his soul. We will talk Ulbert for now. We must continue this meeting. The death vine threats send across an Ulbert with a sharp voice that sends shivers in Ulbert's dark soul. Even though the talks between the two nations resume like nothing happened, the tension in the room still lingers in the air. The ones who joined Touch Me's side are looking spiteful of the ones who joined Ulbert's side. Momonga tries to hold the growing division in the guild as the Guardians also are in chaos after all the Guardian Overseer Albedo is nowhere to be found and Demiurge in their hands cannot be used because of the past occurrences. Then Momonga stands up with the three goddesses stand up also with a surprised expression. The angels and the high-tier undead in the room also felt that. The undead and angels unsheathe their swords and they them at each other. The three goddesses walk out with their retinue a sign that their alliance ended. Momonga ordered Buku Bukagama and Pararan Sino to evacuate Nia and Gezef as the base became chaotic. Ulbert and his group, including Tabulus Maragdina who created Albedo, Rabido and Nigrido have a green light to investigate what is happening on the base as the mirror of remote viewing is blocked. Something or someone does not want outsiders to witness what is happening inside. AAA, east beyond the mountain ranges. In the mountains beyond the east, Different nations stand with their new technologies that can rival or even dominate the nations in the West which are Nazarick Empire and Slain Theocracy when it comes to technology, they have magic but are not powerful like in the West. That is why when these two continents allied with each other the Immortal War. Players panic as they have no superpower beside them to counter these superpowers that is why three advanced stealth warships sail fast in the calm sea towards the Yoveria Empire to possibly create alliances and counter these threats. But now all of the monitors became black as the images shown by the drones became black, with the images outside showing dark clouds suddenly surrounding them. Then they heard a terrifying roar coating their ears as something descended from the clouds, the personification of the nightmare itself. The nightmare galleon with death knights looking down on them emits fear but the old general and one of the players of a mortal war, their prime leader ordered not to attack the vessel. 
Two advanced airships in the sky have entered their radars that can counter their top-of-the-line warships. To have this potential is not surprising for a nation to conquer a continent in months. This is SCE Starlight Air Destroyer Class 0042 of the Sorcerer Celestial Empire. What is your business in these waters? The screens light up again now showing the flag of the Sorcerer Celestial Empire. They can hack into our hardware? The old general shook. To have this ability and have magic at the same time is scary. Now he knows why the alliance between Yggdrasil League and the Magic Conquerors is threatened so much. But the two superpower approach is not correct. They have also an AI defense system, ha? Huh? What a surprise indeed. The prime leader bore a smile as he is now more intrigued and this alliance will be perfect against their enemies. The walls separating their room and the control room open up and the prime leader straighten up as the general behind him does the same. Greetings, Captain of SCE Starlight Air, Destroyer Class 0042. This is the prime leader of Novalon, Kane Alpha. Our ships are heading to Sorcerer's Celestial Empire to discuss diplomatic relations and possibly build an alliance with us, Kane said with a relaxed and diplomatic tone as the screens turn back to normal with all of their surveillance in the perimeter and advanced radars appearing in the screens. The nightmare galleon that scared the shit out of the sailors and crew except for Kane disappeared above in the sky as the advanced airships land in the ocean in front of them. Wait for further instructions as we relay this business to our command center. You are confirmed to go to the Ovaria's main port, and the ambassador of the Sorcerer Celestial Empire will escort you. We will escort your majesty as sea nations are still lurking deep in the oceans and ambushing ships. I am pleased with the accommodation that the Sorcerer Celestial Empire serves, and I will gladly accept it. Now lead the way, Captain. The communication cut as the two airships rose from the ocean and disappear also in the clouds. I hope I passed my sixties, your grace. The old general caresses the scars on his face, which for him are his medals. You are a vampire, General Yamamuro. The prime leader laughed as their convoy goes to the Ovaria escorted by the Sorcerer Empire's airships Aces now Ains teleported into the plaza. Surrounding the plaza are broken down buildings. And saw inside one of the broken buildings without a roof. There is a white stone table with two chairs, and one of the chairs is occupied. He walks slowly towards the building as the ashes vanish with each step he takes and his cape flutter in the windless surroundings. His armor shines in the moonbeams, and the two world-class items in his belt emit an incredible aura that may terrify the gods themselves. He is an angel in a human body, a seraph emperor to be exact. This individual also is not responsible for the dragon emperor's soul extraction, Nova. Revealed as he knows she already cast thousands of spells in advance to be released when danger comes, I expect many things, and now I am disappointed but worried because there is something controlling him. He just doesn't know. Ains internally sighs. After all, he wants to end this to adventure beyond and not just go to war. You are right, Ains Sama. Do you want to use that skill master? Nova suggested with a new tone. A tone where happy and curiosity takes place as she already wants to witness its effects firsthand. She craves wisdom after all. Yes, for necessary precautions, Ains nodded internally. He never uses this skill because he doesn't need to in the Yggdrasil. When he arrived at the front of the broken-down tavern, the one with god-oddly beauty man looked at him and gave him a smile that can be implied as malice or straight-out amusement. Ains didn't say anything and walked in with elegance and authority that he practiced in his room frequently. Instantly the scenery changed. All broken-down walls became new again as portraits of dragons and shiny paint decorated the walls and the surroundings became louder as he saw demi-humans singing and drinking like they're real but Ains saw this as an illusion, a great one. But he let the facade in wandering eyes. He looks outside which implies that it is midnight. A lively one with families of different species walking outside with glee as many demi-human soldiers are patrolling every street. They have this cautious eyes and are on edge sometimes. He deduces that they are in a conflict, he suspected that this is the war between Dragonlords and the players Ains approaches the table where his enemy is sitting as his adversary gesture for him to seat and Ains take the offer and gracefully seat, as he positioned himself using terrifying Emperor seat number two. I hope you don't find this change of scenery alarming Ains Dono. The being in front of him raised his hand and a wolfman nodded at the counter as he prepared a beer for them. Ains then felt that the illusion became more intensified and laughed inside but stayed calm outside. 
Is this the night where the Argland Council has vanished Everdano? Ains looks outside of the windows and actually looks normal for mortals or weak ones, but he saw signs as a strange aura that nobody can see except for him already surrounding the plaza. You are a quick one. This is the exact happenings before the destruction of their home. After Evera spoke, the wolfman delivered them the beers that the human or the angel ordered. The surroundings became blurry. Then the demi-humans looked panicked with the citizens of Argland outside, running terrified as the ground shook wildly. After a few seconds, all of it disappeared and just darkness took place. No sound is to be heard or building to be seen. The scenery then goes back to normal with the broken-down establishments and the aroma of blood lingers again. The wood falls down in the corner of the destroyed bar, but they do not pay it heed. The silence is loud in this graveyard, and only crows are roaming around to find dead prey to eat. It still fascinates me that I cannot watch or view the destruction of their home, Ever shrugs and laughed. In his tone and mannerism is a true psychopath. An interesting trait is this person is an angel or a former one. Rumors and dragonlords themselves narrate that you are the one responsible for their destruction. One of your minions to be specific, the overlord in front of Evera said with the intent of gathering information, a basic notion in a conversation, just rumors, after all, these so-called rumors who spread these stories or the dragonlords themselves are not right there or here when it happened. The servants of the voyagers are the ones responsible for the massacre. Evera smiled as he saw the skeleton sigh and looked back at him. This is all an illusion and if the scenery is changed, all of his servants are surrounding them, hidden by this illusion. He is more powerful now, a declared trainee voyager as the Traveler's Union itself where the voyagers exist sends servants equal to or more powerful than him to kill this skeleton which is Ains. The overlord in front of him just needs to lower his guard and they will attack him. After that they will destroy this world for good to kill this certain undead. Then I trust you, the buffs around the skeleton began to disappear. He is still in doubt as this Ains is like Mamanga, a paranoid one but this Ains is from a different reality. Maybe this variant of Mamanga is arrogant and confident of the overwhelming power he possesses. Evera looked at the surroundings like looking at the walls, but actually examines his servants that are covered in illusion as they nod confirming that the skeleton is lowering his guard and ready for an attack. Your mistake indeed Evera showed his evil smile as his servants attack the skeleton with holy super tier spells as some uses fire-based godly attacks, attacks that are the weakness of an undead. In the night sky, the heavens open up as meteors of large portions that are similar to a small planet fall from the sky. At the same time, a floating kingdom that has angels surrounding it launches a light holy beam toward the skeleton. The warrior-based servants go straight into the undead as they release and pierce all of their weapons inside the skeleton and let out all of their powerful skills. Evera heard the undead scream and it is enjoyable. Evera teleported far away but can still see the scenery in front of him. The small, wrathful planet's impacted skeleton's position where the remains of the Argland stand. The very earth shook violently as the oceans rise from the depths, the shockwaves erased the mountains and all life forms. Evera stays still in his position with his twenty new servants behind him that say nothing. A beautiful sight indeed after ten hours the ground just became desolate, the crust floating toward space. The water evaporated completely with clouds nowhere to be found. Evera ordered his servants to search for living beings and make sure that Ain's old gown is dead with the skeleton servants. They do as told and Evera just wanders in the sky. Is this what ultimate power holds? A flick of a finger and all problems are gone. In front of him is a scenery similar to the apocalypse itself. Half of the world is totally barren and full of rifts, and the other half is broken down into pieces floating into the endless void of space as the ten moons went in different directions. This is the chaos he desires. His dark heart craves this destruction, and to feel such warmth is satisfying in his bones. He snap his fingers and half of the planet which is barely holding up, light up again with green fire at the skeleton's position as the ashes disappear to make sure his adversary is killed. He heard explosions from the distance, his servants killing everything on this planet. He releases all of his spells in the ground, basically like terraforming the world with his servants doing as well. His other gigantic servant, who shook the world with its steps, just stomp all destroyed cities with glee. That is the same creature that destroyed the Argland Council State. 
This creature has crooked features on its face as the wide body is covered in molten rocks that melt the one who touches it. The height of this titan has passed 80,000 meters high piercing the sky. Its feet killed millions with one step, covered also in molten lava, it is too easy that he overthinks that this is real as he pulverizes, again and again, the place where his former adversary is killed. Then the confirmation appeared as the seven voyagers appeared with their servant behind them, the Joker, or formerly named Climb. Their physique is still covered in shadow with their floating glass thrones. They appeared suddenly behind him and gave him a round of applause. To kill one of the direct sons of the three grandfathers and grandmothers is not a child play. The mother will surely bless you for this, and the father will be damned including those three glass sex dolls. One of the voyagers said, smashing the diamond glass armrest and some fragments fall off. Glass sex dolls they are referring to the three grandfather and grandmother's shitty devs. Then the joker became suspicious for a second. It is too easy. There is no hardship or what they called a battle scene. The body of their enemy is also gone because of the pulverizing attack that will surely kill him too if the ambush is for him. This seems to be a trap but size as his masters are here one of the strongest beings in the known reality. They can't be tricked. The Joker or Climb himself look at Evera who is his new master. Eversama, what is the news on the base of our enemy? I hope we gather some resources like world-class items and precious stones. Some of my servants messaged me and said that the tomb is empty and killed all of the guardians inside. Joker's smile lasted for a little, as the news of no such plunder is a grievance in his dark heart, as I expected. Their base is a tomb, but the interesting thing is that their servants are too powerful that I need to escape using a god-class item, the vanishing. The Joker said and find the said item in his storage, but it is nowhere to be found. His mind scrambles on what is happening this item is the most important artifact that is given to him, more important than his very existence. Where is the god-class item that we gave to you? One of the said voyagers spoke with a dark tone. After all, a god-class item is a super rare artifact that may cost abundant damage in the Traveler's Association. The voyagers get these artifacts by killing or destroying the magic system itself and in trillions of years, there are only three recorded destroyed magic systems. So they only have three god-class items. There are only two now when you accounted for the current missing god-class item. Where is it? They shouted at once. Their fury caused the other half of the planet that are whole exploded into large pieces. Evera parried all large pieces of the planet without looking at the projectiles. He only looks in panic joker. He doesn't know the existence of this god-class item. But their reaction means that this item is more powerful than the world-class items. More powerful. So they have more of these god-class items, ever thought, and to acquire on these god-class items is one of his top priorities when he gets inside the Traveler's Association. Then his instinct tingle. Something is wrong and when he is about to convey this feeling of his, the stars in the known galaxy disappeared and the sun that shines bright diminish its radiance. All became dark. Evera have all senses at peak and he can't hear a single thing or scan any life forms including the Voyagers and the Joker. Then a massive rock suddenly loomed over him and impacted him, burying deep the rock and he received damage that shocked him. He tried to stop himself, but he still went deep into the asteroid that suddenly appeared in the darkness. What? He shouted. The rocky inside surface now turned to liquid and this strange black liquid covered his whole body as he went through this seemingly endless asteroid and he is going so fast. So fast that nothing registered what is happening. His sense of touch just defined what is happening in his surrounding. Then he stopped in the middle of this ocean that is inside of an asteroid. All directions are unbounded and endless waters are there to see. The water current then suddenly goes down pulling him down as he saw a large hole that emits light. When he goes past the hole, the scenery changed into greenery surrounded by dragons and angels flying by him as they laughed while looking at him. Several floating landmasses with unique structures in each floating landmass. On the ground, he saw different species of beings fighting each other, humans clad in shiny, exquisite armors versus heteromorphs in their grotesque and horror forms. Magic spewing everywhere in the ground but the surroundings is still blooming in greenery in the middle of this strange world is a large tree with seven globes in different colors hovering around the tree. It is weird that this exact surrounding is familiar, so familiar. Then it struck him. 
This is Yggdrasil itself, where power is unbalanced and death is at its doorstep ready to knock at any moment. Yggdrasil, he look up to see if his HP and level are there. His HP is for a level 1 player, and he look at his level, and he is level 1. Once he landed, he died all bones are crushed and blood spread everywhere. The pain causes extreme emotion for a second, and he is resurrected beside the Yggdrasil tree. The pain still lingers in his body, as he tries to walk in the steps going in the tree's branches. While trying to climb a thousand steps toward the first branch, he suddenly felt pain in his stomach and neck as his vision flew into the sky and saw his own body without a head then his vision disappeared. He started again climbing the steps, but accidents happen whether his bones break into pieces without knowing why, or someone cut random parts of his human body, or the tree itself attack him with its magic itself. But he still climbs. He doesn't know why, but his body just automatically climbs towards it. After hundreds of unique deaths, he experienced he finally goes to the first branch where the Adventurer's Guild of Idrasil is located, to power up, but then a notification sound in his head. Secret dungeon found congratulations. You will be transported in 3, 2, 1. Before he can ready himself, or find a way to cancel this suddenly forced teleportation he disappeared in sight, and is now surrounded by an unfamiliar realm. The tree is nowhere to be found, and a tower replaced its place. A tower that loomed tall and imposing, piercing the sky as a sword thrust deep into the heavens that the peak of the tower cannot be seen in his human eyes. The tower is covered in identical arch windows with dark, shadowy walls streaked with ancient runes and symbols, glowing with an eerie, pulsing light that seems to scare his soul. The entrance of this strange tower dungeon has large double gates with the left side impersonating the clouds themselves and the other side being a black tar that radiates extreme heat. Thousands of well-detailed and precise statues of beautiful demons and terrifying angels surround the tower with different sizes depending on the angel's features. These statues look so real and anyone who gazes will surely tell that they will move at any second. Evera walks slowly. He felt their gazes and fear struck again in his soul. Ah! Extreme pain courses through his neck part. He screamed in pain and fear as he hold on to where the cut is. He looks instantly at his hand and there is no blood. After that, he caresses slowly his neck and there are no cuts. An illusion? Impossible. He felt pain and sensed that he is slashed by a sword. Then looked again at the demonic and seraphic statues and now they all are holding the same plain red swords. He gulped and continued to the entrance of the dungeon. When he crossed the double gates, it suddenly closed with a loud bang that is where his powers was restored, but he can't get out of the tower. He tried to force the double doors, but nothing happened even a dent, then the only way out is in, thus just to continue going up the stairways. Chapter 44 The Tower After several minutes of going up the stairs, Evera saw the end of the ridiculous long stairs and hurried. He jumps and flies with his delay spells ready to attack every being on this floor. But nothing jumped or attacked him. He is welcomed by a dark forest full of unknown glowing plants. He also hear weird sounds breaking the silence in this forest. He look upwards and saw the bloody sky. The red moon seems real as he shot a magic arrow, and it went above the clouds. It cannot be a floor of a dungeon, the magic arrow will bounce on the walls as a floor has a limit. With his great sight, he still saw the magic arrow continuing its journey toward the dark heavens. Then he looks behind him where the stone stairs he emerges from, and it is still there. He just leave it aside for now, and started to follow a dirt path going deeper into the forest. There will be definitely traps that is why he cast Enhanced Tremor Sense for detecting any kind of movement in the whole forest and discern life form to find any life form in the area whether it is alive or considered immortal. While walking with his sense of sight at its peak and the spells searching for any possible beings on this floor he sensed nothing. There is some but his sight told him that they are just small animals like the white rabbits and red-colored chickens just going in their way. After an hour of walking the dirt path, he is following ended and now tall green trees are blocking his way. The red moon still illuminates his surroundings with shadows copying all trees' forms. There is nothing to see here. He didn't felt anything or sense something. That is the only odd thing he felt. He didn't sense the white rabbits and red-colored chickens' movements. They are like seasoned assassins and ninjas. Their shadows also are peculiar. He didn't see anything wrong with their shadows. 
He just felt there is something wrong in the shadows lurking behind all things that the red moon illuminate. Then it struck him. He cast Shadow Step, and he saw the other side of this forest. The Shadow Step is a spell to cross the threshold between reality and the Shadow Realm. Like a copy of one's reality, a mirror of the original world but has no colors in it, just black and white. The shadows of all trees have beings of the shadow lurking, looking at him with the intent to kill. When they knew he detected them, they lunged at him with their sharp claws that could dig to the bones of a titan. But Evra is above a titan thus he raised his hands and the dark misty blade came forth. He took it and swing it creating a dark shade slash that cut through every shadow being as he runs towards the stairs that could lead to another floor. The surrounding is still black and white because the only way to access the stairs leading to the next floor is by going into the shadow realm. Countless, almost thousands of shadows attack at all directions as they make screeching noises that piece his hearing. Nonetheless he cut them without getting a scratch and when he stepped foot on the stairs, the shadows retreated to the floor as he stepped out of the accursed shadow realm. He doesn't look back and the tower tremor as he climbed again in the stairs not knowing where this will lead. Say ye ye Tower of Yggdrasil, 70th floor, the home of the Black Goat. The voyagers are in an unknown place, nothing just green bricks on the ground and endless darkness. As they use their powers to know where they are, and the spell just said they are in nowhere. One of the seven voyagers punched the green tiles into the ground, and it did not break even the punch produced large shockwaves. They are actually not the voyagers, they are just rogue servants of them, and they didn't know how they are alive right now as the voyagers are heavenly beings that can kill anything in their path, even eliminating a magic system is child's play to them. The god class item that is lost just now is one of the artifacts that they stole successfully from the Traveler's Association. All of a sudden, a dark, strange fog formed in the center of this place. Shrieking starts to pierce their ears, and the glass of reality starts to melt around it with tentacles seen from the shadows inside the dark fog. Their strong minds started to weaken as its very presence brought terror and madness to those who encountered it, even the gods or super beings alike. Then all of the voyagers, or the traitor servants flinch, stories of these beings are straight out horror even to them. Then in the dark fog, come out its writhing mass of tentacles, lashing in the green tiles that turn the tiles into black dust. Then the air is filled with terrifying sounds, and in the dark fog, its eyes appeared, staring directly at their heavenly souls. Its eyes are glowing like hot coals in the darkness, seeming to see into the very souls of those who stood before it. When they know who it is, they started to fly in the opposite direction. They don't know where they are, but they need to get away from it. Ah. Eh? The writhing mass of tentacles grabs them one by one into the dark fog, and when tentacles pull them inside the dark fog, nothing, even a sound, comes out. When all of them are devoured in the fog, the being on this floor, Shub Nigurath, goes back to her rest, waiting for another weakling to be eaten. Say, see, see, slain theocracy, Kami Miyako. Slain theocracy is one of the greater nations in the entire world where religious customs are their golden rules. The people are so devoted to their gods that they will do anything that their gods want them to do. That is why priests have a high position and are well respected in the slain theocracy as they are also connected to politics. Now the slain theocracy's military was composed of several different branches, each with its own strengths and specialties. The main branch was the Holy Order, which was responsible for the defense of the nation and the enforcement of theocracy's laws. The Holy Order was made up of powerful paladins and clerics who had been blessed by the six great gods and were capable of wielding divine magic. In the middle of the slain theocracy's capital, Kami Miyako is the cathedral, the most important place in the entire nation. It is a large white cathedral that stood high as it almost pierced the heavens. All of its citizens, even the residents of the cathedral, are always awestruck by its intricate carvings and ornate design. The white stone walls were adorned with intricate mosaics and stained glass windows, depicting scenes of holy significance. A special scripture guards this towering cathedral, and it is the White Rose Scripture. They are clad in white gleaming armor with red intricate edges. In their belts are two enchanted swords, and in the back is their great shield with the sigil of a cross in the middle. They are trained by the Black Scripture to be one of the elites of the slain theocracy, as they are a specialized scripture that guards the cathedral. 
priests and bishops alike, are walking also in the hallways with the white rose paladins bowing as a sign of respect and authority. But they did not bat an eye at them as all of them gossiped about a commotion that involves a new priest who suddenly rose up in the ranks like never been seen before. The immaculate face and charisma seems to spread joy and holiness in the cathedral. Some bishops also talk about this fellow as the one that is promised in the prophecy. But this is not confirmed because their gods are nowhere to be found, especially the holiness Evra. That is why the cardinals are the ones governing the country with its vassals at their shoulders. Calm down. The gods have a lot on their plate. That is why they are nowhere to be found. In the meeting chambers, seven cardinals wearing only simple white robes and no pieces of jewelry, or such gives luxury as their luxury is their devotion to their gods. That is right. The gods will not leave us. One of the cardinals spoke the general on the other hand shouted, We are open for our enemies to be attacked and you all order for massacring a town? What is the meaning of this? They are worshipping that self-proclaimed skeleton god. Ains was it. Heresy should not be tolerated. The cardinal of dark shouted with rage, with the other cardinals except for Pontifex clenching their fists. Do you have evidence of this? The cardinals are quiet, showing that they hear this heresy on gossips alone. So you don't have any? Now outside of the capital, many are protesting. You should have consulted the war council before you commit massacre. Massacre? Cleansing of heretics is the right term, the cardinal of the light said with monotone expression, like they did not commit horrendous crimes. The people do not see it that way, cardinal. You just committed a crime against the people. Against the law. He said with an edge and spite. I should command the army to arrest you and the sunlight scripture for doing such things. To defend a heretic is a heretic general, the cardinal of fire, infighting should not be tolerated in this chamber. Crimes of the cardinal council should be tolerated for we are in dire situations and dire acts are not prohibited. Pontifex Maximus dictated that quiet the whole room. After all he is second to the gods themselves, no one is above the law, the grand general thought as his face hardened. After the meetings that ensue between the Grand General and the Cardinals, he excuses himself as his commanders are waiting for him outside, they are also looking distraught on the paladins guarding the meeting chambers. These paladins commit massacre on the civilians without evidence that disgusts the military of theocracy. When the Grand General go past them, they followed and as they stroll in the hallways of this cathedral, the priests and bishops look at them like ants and sometimes spat at them. Thanks to their harsh training this did not affect them but this disrespect builds up a large gap between the military and the religion as the gods are nowhere to put an end to this. While they are just looking straight paying no attention to the surroundings someone blocks their way. He is covered with white expensive sheets and his face is carved by the gods themselves. His smile will lighten every storm in the way and even with the covers of the white sheets in his body, the body physique is still seen. Behind him is a polished white shiny paladin clad in white shiny armor and a red shiny cape behind him. The unknown priest bowed to them and his immaculate voice blessed their hearing, greetings the protector of this nation, our heroes if I may say. I am Nyar the Archbishop of Kami Miyako. If you don't mind Archbishop Nyar, I know the Archbishop of Kami Miyako is Archbishop Nao. What happened to him? His way of questioning looked like he is happy that the Archbishop is now removed which he is because of the hate he holds against his men. The archbishop looked behind him where his shiny bodyguard is positioned, and the knight just shrugged. The archbishop sighed and looked at them. He is actually missing and I am to take his place, general, and as we will meet frequently you can just all call me Nyar. The archbishop said with his smile still beaming the general looks shocked. This is his first time meeting an official that respects him and his commanders. Your presence is surely giving a new atmosphere around here, Nyar. Then you should just call me Robert, the hardened face bore a smile and said, You should replace the higher-ups as they are stupid and blind. I must go now and work is calling me. I will replace them in time. Robert, with your help of course, Nyar smiled ear to ear. Literally as the shiny knight just shook his head and just followed the humming archbishop. He already manipulates the religion. But he needs to convince the army and the citizens to revolt against their homeland. Weakened it inside, and it automatically will rot outside. After the revolution, they will openly welcome the empire as the new ruler to spread peace and prosperity. He actually didn't change anything, just small disappearance to have his way on the hierarchy, but overall this is their own doing. 
Face AA Tower, 100th floor, throne room Ains is on the throne watching the defenses of the selected floors with the overseers beside him. They at first worry because this is the first time upper floors are being tested, but their worries disappear because they are being handled accordingly. This Evra is tested for the spawn NPCs and will be fighting against Rovuna on her floor where he is headed now. She requested it after all because to redeem herself and Ains agreed. But first of all, how are they transported here? Ains uses his skill, change the world. With the help, Nova, going beyond again with her calculations and modifications that alter one's reality in a limited amount of time. In his hand is a book called The Vanishing, which allows the user to have complete invisibility that even Shub and Rabido will not detect. Then he heard a slight noise and remembered the Joker is in front of the flight of stairs with his royal guards holding down this visitor. He keeps murmuring about the collapse of the other worlds, as this Joker told the truth about their wide operation in other worlds, and he gets this information with his royal guard's torture expertise at its best. The Joker's master who is pretending to be voyagers has other agents like him in other worlds, and he gives them a list of these agents. Demiurge and the overseers will convert these agents to be theirs for information gathering and other purposes. The world is now on collapse and the Sorcerer Celestial Empire will bring back the broken pieces with their place on the top as the negotiations between the Sorcerer Empire and Immortal War. Players are going smoothly as the Immortal War nations will declare war on magic conquerors backed by the Sorcerer Empire. Demiurge forms various cunning plans after the new war that will convert these players to Sorcerer vassals. On the magic conquerors' side, the Overseers send various agents of the SSA to spread the virus that can kill a specific group with its spread transmission through the air. They will kill the ones who can hinder the victory of Immortal War players except for the select few that may benefit the Sorcerer Empire. A reset of the world is a necessity to bring the Supreme One's order on top without opposition and fatal damage on Ain's side. Your plans are coming to fruition Ain Sama. Even without us, you can do this without delay. I am in awe of your infinite wisdom, Demiurge said with devotion as Ains became uncomfortable again. You must not down yourself as you have a big part in this. You all have and I am very proud of you all, Ains said as he thought. You plan all of this and I just get along with it, Lady Luck at my side. All of the guardians present, including the five overseers, are filled with joy right now as they bowed all together and thanked him for his generosity. After several talks about his plan they escort or specifically drag him outside of the throne room, and the guardians excuse themselves to return to their duties. Now Ains has to prepare for a visit to the immortal world's continent, as he reasoned that he needs to observe their new allies' capabilities, and the overseers agreed, but the whole royal army will be dispatched to be his escort with Shub Nigirath, Rabido, and other world enemy guardians that is yet to be chosen. He now continues to watch as the Rovuna vs. Evra is about to start. A is E Extra Chapter Life of Ain's Royal Guards The Royal Guards are once seraphs and incubi slash succubi that are the first summoned of Ain's old gown. These angelic and demonic perfect beings that sole purpose is to guard the Supreme Emperor's existence. Their devotion to him is extreme that anything, anything that is ordered by the Supreme One they will execute without question even killing an overseer. They are versed or very skilled in combat, tactics, assassination, politics, being a maid or a butler, and anything that might the Supreme One does need for them. Also, all of them can be the commander of the Royal Air Fleet and Imperial Ground Escort, so that if the position commander of these two escort fleets loses their commanders, the one who is close to the commander's position, or the one who first responds takes the lead immediately. They are the epitome of strength as one of them can be considered a one-man army that can fight 10 level 100 players with ease because in Yggdrasil Wars they are always present as Ains, just sends them to be stronger and unknowingly they gather experience from the battlefield. Every secret of the Supreme Emperor Ains old gown is safe with them and any that is being revealed to them will not be spread outside of the Royal Guard circle even if their souls are tortured. Also, the secrets that are revealed will not be judged by them as every move or thought of Ains is righteous. That is why when they saw or watched the practice of the emperor in the mirror, giving speeches while looking at himself, they pay it no heed, and sometimes they applaud. Then one day the emperor calls for the captain of his royal guard Halo Callisto, a seraph but not totally biased against the demon. After all he sees demons and angels as equal. 
He is also capable of doing things that evil God may despise for his supreme emperor. He trained every royal guard when he has a chance every day and commenced a drill where one or a squad of royal guards infiltrate the throne room of the 100th floor and the royal floating castle. The emperor implied that he pushes this rest day on every royal guard with the support of the overseers, which is why he can't oppose this rather punishment than reward after all their sole purpose is to die for the supreme emperor and serve him with all of their might. But he still shows gratitude for this generosity that the supreme one bestowed. A full battalion every day has a rest day, but even if they can go outside of the supreme imperial city, they do not do so as if the emperor is in need of them they can respond to his call with haste. After all a battalion only consists of a hundred, and the whole royal guard army consists of twenty thousand seraph and succubi slash incubi elites. When they are seen in public many are awed by their presence, as even the tallest beings look smaller when in comparison. Their aura even hidden completely is still dominating. Their armor is a combination of black and white that shone and absorbs light at the same time around them. Each of the royal guard's armors is a special divine class item created by the greatest blacksmiths of the tower led by Lux, as precious and rare materials are used to create their armor. That is why when every blacksmith saw their armor, they would trade their partners to have the armor. The royal guards have only two places to go. The cathedral is the most frequent one, and the second is the military bases inside the supreme imperial city restricted to civilians. The paladins and priests looked at the royal guards as living saints after all these beings were chosen by the supreme one to guard him. A great honor, if you ask a paladin. When they are finished worshipping the supreme one, the royal guards visit the military bases inside and inspect them. Sometimes they train the whole base, and it will be the most grueling training that the supreme troppers well experienced. Some officers will be removed from the ranks because of a failure from certain orders of the royal guards, and no one will interfere with it, even the grand marshals. Say CEO. So as implied in this chapter is that the Travelers Association is not to be messed with as they have the power to destroy worlds or one timeline with a snap, but their vast knowledge and thinking surpass these barbaric ways and view the reality on a much more different way. So sorry for the late update, I will not stop the update of this story, just a few delays so this may seem a bit short for a long wait. These past days I think what to add but there is nothing more to write.